All right. Hi, everyone. I am Melissa Green, and Technology Accessibility Training Specialist with the Faculty Resource Center's Emerging Technology and Accessibility Team. Our team works to ensure that all technology users, including those with disabilities, have a functional and accessible technology experience with the university's websites and the technologies we use for teaching, learning, and administrative functions. You can find more information about our efforts on our website at accessibility.ua.edu. This slide includes a picture of me. I have my webcam turned off. I'm actually presenting from home today. Uh, but I thought you might like to see who you're speaking with this afternoon. This session will provide an introduction to web accessibility, uh, laws and standards regarding accessibility in higher education, the university's web accessibility policy, uh, common accessibility challenges and solutions, and resources and strategies you can use to address those challenges to create accessible documents, images, audio, video, and web content. A quick moment for housekeeping. To improve audio quality, I have muted everyone by default, but when you want to talk, just select the microphone icon in your Zoom controls to mute or unmute yourself. You can also choose to have your camera on or off, but please do mute your microphone when you're not speaking. When I'm talking or sharing my screen, uh, please write in the chat box and let me know if you can't see or hear something. You are welcome to use that chat box throughout. I may not be able to watch closely while I'm talking, but I will do my best to check in every once in a while. And if I don't see your question or comment immediately, um, I'll come back to it at the end. This session is being recorded, and I'll send you a link to that recording via email in the next few days, along with links to the resources shared during the session. Uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So first, the case for accessibility. The power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. This quote from Dr. Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the World Wide Web, really sums up for me what this digital accessibility stuff is all about, equal access and opportunity. Access to information and communications is also a basic human right, according to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So just who are we talking about when we talk about disability and who are we leaving out when we fail to design for accessibility? Figures from the World Health Organization indicate that about 15% of the world's population lives with some form of disability. In the U.S. Census Bureau's latest American Community Survey, an estimated 13% of the U.S. population reported a disability. And the latest data from the U.S. Department of Education indicates that about 11% of undergraduates at degree-granting post-secondary institutions like ours report having a disability. We have to be careful with statistics. They often rely on self-reporting. Uh, many students don't register with disability services. And the definitions of disability vary across measurements, uh, making it hard to make comparisons. Uh, also, the disability experience is diverse and deeply personal and can't really uh, be adequately counted just by looking at numbers. However, statistics can give us a bit of an idea of just how many people we leave out when we fail to ensure our projects are accessible. And it's quite a few, somewhere between, between 10 and 20% of the global population. Designing for accessibility benefits everyone though, and not just people with disabilities. There's a significant overlap between making digital materials accessible for mobile device users and people with disabilities. Someone using their mobile phone in bright sunlight and someone who has color vision deficiency or color blindness, uh, may both have difficulty perceiving color. Both the smartphone owner attempting to watch a video in a noisy environment and the deaf or hard of hearing user may be unable to hear the audio track. Improving access for one benefits the other. So let's say in the case of our 
person with color blindness and our low vision user having sufficient contrast will be beneficial to both. In the case of our video watcher in a noisy environment and our video watcher who's deaf or hard of hearing, having captions or transcript benefits both. Google also gives higher ranking to mobile friendly sites. Um, so all other things being equal, uh, if one site is deemed more mobile friendly than the other, it will appear higher in Google search results. Some of the criteria that Google uses to determine if a site is mobile friendly um, also makes for a more accessible site. So Google considers sites to be mobile friendly if they avoid flash and other software not common on mobile devices, uh, use text that's readable without zooming, size content to the screen, and provide enough space between links for the correct one to be easily selected on a small screen. All those things make a site more accessible as well. While accessibility and usability aren't the same thing, everyone can benefit from intuitive and consistent interactions and elements, and accessible web content is generally more usable. Accessibility also increases findability and search engine optimization. And we already talked about uh, Google and mobile friendly sites and a lot of those characteristics are shared with accessible sites. Some other ways that accessibility improves search engine optimization are that proper heading structure and descriptive link text are a boon to both accessibility and SEO. The alternative text for images, so the text that you give to describe the content or function of an image on your website, as well as transcripts and captions for multimedia uh, expose your online content to search engines. If you've ever used Google Image Search, you've experienced this. Uh, among other things, Google uses alternative text to help determine the subject of an image and therefore the best results to return. If those reasons aren't compelling enough for you, uh, it is the law. Um, if you live in the United States, applicable laws include the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, and the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, specifically sections 504 and 508. The ADA is comprehensive civil rights legislation. It protects people with disabilities from discrimination in public services, programs and activities. And while the ADA doesn't explicitly address web accessibility, it does require that state and local governments and businesses and nonprofit organizations that serve the public communicate with people with disabilities just as effectively as they communicate with people without disabilities. The Rehabilitation Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in programs conducted by federal agencies. And this also includes uh, programs receiving federal financial assistance, federal employment, and the employment practices of federal contractors. The portions of the Rehab Act that are most relevant to accessibility are Section 504, which states that programs or activities receiving federal money must not discriminate on the basis of disability, and Section 508, which requires that information technology procured or used by the federal government be accessible to people with disabilities, including employees and members of the public. In higher education, additional laws and requirements apply. If you feel like you've been hearing more about accessibility, particularly on our campus in recent years, you're absolutely right. Um, in 2010, in response to a complaint filed by the National Federation of the Blind, or NFB, the U.S. Department of Justice entered into a settlement with colleges and universities that had been using the Kindle e-reader as part of a pilot study with Amazon. So at the time, the Kindle was inaccessible to blind students because the menu and control features of the device did not include text-to-speech functionality. So you had to have use of your vision in order to use the Kindle and to access the course materials that these colleges and universities were uh, providing via the Kindle in their pilot. 
In a subsequent Dear Colleague letter to colleges and universities, the U.S. Departments of Education and Justice uh, stated that requiring the use of emerging technology that is not accessible to students with disabilities constitutes discrimination under Section 504 and the ADA. And they reminded colleges and universities, including us, we received this letter at UA, um, reminded us of our responsibility to ensure students have equal access to technologies used for teaching and learning. Universities are now charged with planning for accessible technologies, um, and that includes everything from tools to services to information. Uh, according to the Departments of Justice and Education, um, as a public education institution, we must provide accessible programs and services either directly or through equivalent facilitation, uh, have a plan for how technology resources will be made accessible, demonstrate progress towards fulfillment of that plan, and really most importantly, keep lines of communication with our users open and obvious. So what do we mean when we say that technology must be accessible? The U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights Policy Guidance defines accessible as follows, and I'm reading here. Uh, accessible means a person with a disability is afforded the opportunity to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability in an equally effective and equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. The person with the disability must be able to obtain the information as fully, equally, and independently as a person without a disability. It's that last part to me that really sums up that entire sort of paragraph from policy guidance. The person with a disability must be able to obtain the information as fully, equally and independently as a person without a disability. Now, ideally, all of our technologies are fully accessible. We have one version of any given piece of content, you know, one website, one uh, PDF, one app um, that works for everyone and meets everyone's accessibility needs. However, sometimes that just isn't possible. Um, nothing will ever be 100% accessible. We will never completely remove the need for accommodations. Um, so when that's the case, let's say um, we're using vendor supplied products and there's nothing on the market that is completely accessible that meets our business case. Um, we've selected the most accessible alternative, but yet it still isn't fully accessible. It doesn't mean we can't use it. It just means that we have to um, be creative and come up with a way to provide that equally effective, equally integrated, um, equivalent ease of use option. Some examples of that, um, let's say a chemistry instructor wanted their students to use an app that allows them to visualize different um, molecular structures. There's only one app out there that does that. However, it uh, doesn't work with VoiceOver, the uh, Apple iOS screen reading program used by people who are blind or have low vision. That doesn't mean the instructor can't um, ask their students to use the app. What it means is that the instructor needs to provide another way for students who can't use the app to access the same information. And that could be any number of things. That could be a website or a web page with images that are described in the text. It could be a narrated video um, that's captioned that describes what the molecules look like. You know, in the case of a face-to-face -face class, um, it could be manipulables, um, like little plastic models that the students assemble or, or get to touch. So there's really a number of different ways that someone might provide equivalent access. Another example, um, our library, like every research library across the country, um, provides access to hundreds of databases um, that contain scholarly research materials. Many of these materials are delivered in the form of a PDF. 
Some of the PDFs provided by the vendors are accessible. Others are only somewhat accessible. Others aren't accessible at all. They're just an image of a PDF. Can our library realistically go through and download every single PDF and remediate it so that it's fully accessible? No, and no one expects them to do that. Um, however, they can provide equivalent access uh, by providing access to another format when that's available. Um, so for example, many items are available in both PDF and HTML format, so that would be one way. Another way is leaving lines of communication with the user open. So if someone has trouble accessing or using a PDF, they can contact the library and the library can provide the information in a format that's accessible to them. So um, this is what the definition is. Again, ideally we build accessibly, we purchase accessibly, but when that's not possible, uh, we need to provide equally effective, equally integrated, um, substantially equivalent ease of use. There are two major sets of standards or guidelines um, that are most commonly used to determine if web content is accessible. The standards specified in Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, which apply to technology procured or used by the federal government, and the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, which Department of Education Office of Civil Rights Resolution Agreements have referred to as a benchmark for measuring the accessibility of online content. Many colleges and universities strive to meet the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, including ours. Uh, WCAG, um, is a set of international guidelines developed by the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, the governing body of the web, and are the basis of most web accessibility law in the world. Uh, version 2.0 of these guidelines is based on four principles. According to WCAG 2.0, in order to be accessible, content must be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. WCAG 2.0 consists of three priority levels that act as an industry standard, with A being the minimum level of conformance and AAA being the level of conformance that ensures access to the greatest number of people. So if your content meets A level, it's accessible to many. If it meets AAA level, it's accessible to most. AA is somewhere in between. Since 2015, UA administration and UA web professionals have been making progress to ensure that our public facing and campus wide web resources meet WCAG 2.0 AA over the next four years. This is a pretty exciting time to be doing accessibility work at the university. Uh, the technology accessibility team has been leaning the initiative to provide our technology users, including those with disabilities, a functional and accessible technology experience. I mentioned that this initiative has been underway since 2015. Um, we are on year four, which we set as a goal um, to achieve WCAG 2.0 AA by the end of year four. The university just recently implemented a web accessibility policy that officially adopts WCAG 2.0 AA to address the accessibility of public facing web resources, campus wide web resources, and core university administrative and academic functions. Um, I'm not going to pull up the policy right now. I am presenting from home, so I'm a little limited in screen space. However, there's a link to that policy on the university's policies webpage, which you can access at policies.ua.edu. So policies.ua.edu, it's called the Web Resources Accessibility Policy. Let's talk a bit more about WCAG's perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, uh, which is also referred to collectively as poor. In order for content to be perceivable, it must be available to the senses through the browser or through assistive technologies. People who have full use of all of their site are able to read text, view images, um, understand the visual, visual cues that are afforded by layouts, 
I understand the symbolic meaning of colors in certain contexts. For example, red meaning stop, green meaning go. Uh, people who have full use of their hearing are able to listen to audio and video. But since not everyone has the same abilities or equal use of all of their senses, one of the main keys to accessibility is ensuring that information is transformable from, from one form to another so it can be perceived in different ways. So accessible text, actual text rather than an image of text, can be transformed into audio by screen readers and into braille by refreshable braille displays. Audio can be transformed into text through captions and transcripts. Uh, graphics, animations, videos are transformed into something perceivable through text alternatives. When content is operable, users can interact with all controls and interactive elements using either the mouse, keyboard, or an assistive device. Um, so standard computer use typically involves a monitor and a mouse or a touchpad, uh, but not everyone accesses the computer that way. Um, someone who doesn't see is probably not using a monitor or a mouse. They're likely um, using strictly their keyboard to interact with the computer. Someone who has limited or no use of their hands and arms uh, may be utilizing a piece of assistive technology called a switch, which is kind of like a button that you can press uh, to navigate through content. Um, we need to ensure that our content can be accessed um, through all of those things, mouse, keyboard, or assistive device. Understandable content is clear and limits confusion and ambiguity. And when content is robust, a wide range of technologies can be used to access it. And not just assistive technologies that help people with disabilities, but a range of devices and browsers too, which I think further illustrates how accessibility benefits everyone. Um, the key to ensuring that content is robust across technologies is following HTML and CSS standards. So how can we do it? How can we create content that people with disabilities can perceive, operate, and understand, and works across a range of technologies? Uh, well, that's a pretty tall order. There's no way we can address the entire diversity of the disability experience and all of the different types of web content. So we're going to focus instead on a few fundamental web accessibility principles. And these principles, as well as a few others, are outlined um, in a handout that I'm about to paste a link to in the chat. I'll also send it to you via email with the webinar recording. Okay, I just pasted links to those in the chat. Adding alternative text or alt text for images is really the first principle of digital accessibility. Alternative text provides a textual alternative to non-text content in documents and web pages, and it serves several functions. It is read by screen readers in place of images, allowing the content and the function of the image to be accessible to those with visual or certain cognitive disabilities. And I've said screen readers a few times now. I'm going to stop for a second and, and just provide a brief description of that if it's not a term with which you're familiar. A screen reader is a piece of assistive technology that converts digital text to synthesized speech. Um, it's also called text-to-speech technology. So if you've ever um, asked Siri a question and Siri's read aloud information from a Wikipedia article in response, or maybe you're navigating using Google Maps and Google Ma Maps is voicing the step-by-step -step directions. This is similar technology. Uh, Text-based information is being read aloud using synthesized speech. So screen readers are the primary way that people who are blind access digital content um, including web pages. They may also be used by people who have low vision, um, 
people who have cognitive disabilities, people who have learning disabilities, uh, people who prefer to hear information read aloud or learn more easily when they hear information read aloud, or others who might like to hear information read aloud as they read the text. So again, primarily used by users who are blind and low vision, but also used um, by others as well. So alternative text allows users who are using a screen reader to hear a description of an image. And many times um, because they are not seeing that image. But alternative text serves a couple other functions as well. It's displayed in place of the image in browsers if the image file is not loaded or when the user has chosen not to view images. You know, if you've ever um, opened up an email and Outlook and the security features have blocked the loading of the image, you may see the alternative text there instead. Um, alternative text can also be read by search engines. Um, as I mentioned when I was talking about Google image search. So it, it really serves multiple functions. Every image needs alternative text that provides an equivalent to the image content. And the alternative text can be presented in two ways. Within the alt attribute of the image element, so in the HTML, or within the context or surroundings of the image itself. Alt text should present the content and function of an image and not necessarily a description of the visual appearance of the image. Uh, when determining appropriate alt text for images, context is everything. The alternative text for an image may be vastly different based on the context and surroundings of the image. So this slide includes um, an image of, it's a picture of a postgraduate engineering student working in an electron microscope lab. Let's say that the image on this slide appears on a web page about new developments to the engineering building. If the purpose of having that picture on the College of Engineering website is to showcase the new buildings, technologies, and spaces, you know, picture of a student or postgraduate engineering student will not convey the content and function of the image. Um, more effective alt text in that case might be a postgraduate engineering student working in the new electron microscope lab. If you think about it, um, this same image could possibly appear on the website of the microscope manufacturer. And in that case, it, it might have still different alternative text. You know, it might focus more on the microscope itself rather than the lab or the student. It might say, you know, the model um, ABC offers XYZ features. One basic web accessibility principle is to ensure the accessibility of non-HTML content uh, linked to from web pages, including documents. You can create alt text for shapes, pictures, charts, tables, smart art graphics, um, and other objects in Office documents. In Microsoft Office 2016, as uh, depicted in a couple screenshots on this slide, to add alternative text, you right click an image, select format picture or format object, kind of depending on um, the type of content, and then select the alt text pane. In the description box in the alt text pane, you enter an explanation of the object. Optionally, you can also add a title, although what you type in the title field is not read by all screen readers. Um, if you export your Word document to a tagged PDF using Save as PDF, only the text you type in the description field will be included in the PDF as alt text. So when working with Microsoft Office content, be sure to describe the content and function of your images in the description field. The process for adding alt text looks a little different in Office 365 versions of Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and Outlook. I wanna point this out to you because I think it's better and because it will eventually look like this in other versions of the software. So um, my Zoom controls are blocking this, so I'm gonna move them just momentarily up to the top of the screen. To 
to add alt text to a visual object in Office 365, you right click the object and you can select edit alt text directly from the right click menu. Whereas before you had to first select format, either format picture, format chart, and so on. So you can right click, select edit alt text, and then the alt text pane uh, will open. There you get a prompt um, that tells you or asks you how would you describe the object and its context to someone who's blind. So you have one space to enter that in. You don't have to sort of struggle to decide should I enter it as a title or description. Um, there's also kind of an interesting feature um, that attempts to use artificial intelligence to generate a description of the image. So you can trigger that by selecting generate a description for me. If you don't like the description that's generated, you can supply your own description. And there's the ability to mark the alt text as decorative, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about momentarily. So I share this just because some of you may already be working with Office 365 or might soon be working with Office 365. I also anticipate that um, upcoming other versions of Office will look a little bit more like this as well. I think it's better. Let me move these controls again. For web content, you can usually add alt text by editing the image details in a media library or when you add the image to a content or collection management system using the visual or WYSIWYG editor. So this slide includes a screenshot of the image details box that appears when you edit an image in the WordPress visual editor. Um, and that image details dialog includes a field for entering alt text for the image. You can also add alt text to the HTML code itself. This slide includes a screenshot of the WordPress HTML or text editor. Uh, the editor includes an image element defining an image in an HTML page. So the image um, is, is a JPEG, it's titled Pup, Pup Dance Party. You know, mentally I was thinking it was the, the same image of the two puppies on the previous screen. So our, our image is the Pup Dance Party JPEG. And then the alt attribute of that element provides a description of the image. Um, in this case, puppies dancing. Um, those are examples of how one might add alternative text in some popular production tools at UA. You know, if you use others, it's likely that they offer the ability to add alter alternate text, whether it's um, in a media library, in a WYSIWYG, in the HTML, and then there's always the context of the image itself. Um, so find out what options are available for you and uh, put them to use. If an image has no relevant content or function, um, if it's decorative or the alternative text is provided in the nearby text, then the image should have an empty or null alternative text value. When working in HTML, null or empty alternative text um, is alt equals quote quote with no space in between. So in the example on the screen, Let's say the picture of uh, the dogs is purely decorative. Um, we, the alt text in that case should be alt equals quote, and then we'd leave out puppies dancing, close the quotation mark. So alt equals quote, quote, with no space in between. If the image is a link or a hotspot, the alt text should describe the link's function. When writing alt text, you should avoid words like picture of, image of, or link to in your alt text as the screen reader provides this information. Uh, usually when a screen reader user encounters an image, the screen reader will say something like graphic, and then it will read aloud the alt text. So graphic, puppies dancing, graphic, Denny chimes, um, and so on. So you just don't need the words picture, image, and so on, it's repetitive. You should also use the fewest words necessary. The next principle of digital accessibility is ensuring that your content is well structured and clearly written by using the simplest language appropriate for your content 
and organizing your content using true headings and lists. Someone who doesn't have full use of their vision can't see the larger or bold font um, often used to indicate titles or headings or subheadings, but they can perceive the appropriate markup and use it to navigate through a document um, or other digital content with a screen reader. Uh, you want to use true headings rather than simply changing the font, enlarging the font size, and making the text you, that you want to be perceived as a title or a heading bold. Uh, this slide depicts a document that includes headings added via the styles function in Microsoft Word. Uh, in Microsoft Word, a quick way to see if your document includes appropriate heading styles is to turn on the navigation pane. If headings are missing or improperly nested, you can use the styles options to fix them. Um, because this is a, a web focused webinar, I'm not going to go into too much more detail about Word and styles, but I will include links to information about that in the webinar follow up email. Looking at web content where our team um, most frequently sees this go astray is folks using text formatting like, like font size, color, or weight to give the visual appearance of headings rather than using actual headings and other styles. Or vice versa, um, folks selecting to style their text as a heading because they like the way the style looks. Um, but not necessarily to reflect the function of a heading. So this slide includes a screenshot of the WordPress visual editor. The author of this WordPress page or post has applied some built-in WordPress styles. Um, in this case, heading two and heading three. Um, headings are to be used hierarchically. Um, so you need to start, you wouldn't use three before two or four before three. Um, the reason why the content and this particular page or post is starting with heading level two is because in most WordPress themes, uh, the page or post title is already marked as a heading one. So again, we, we don't want to have more than one heading one and we don't want to skip heading levels. So it's usually most appropriate to start the heading levels in the body of your page or post with heading two. You'll need to check um, the, the theme or template being used in your area where you create content to be sure. But in many cases, uh, page or post title is heading level one. When the styles are applied, the visual appearance of the text does change. Uh, most notably in this case, the font size is larger, but more importantly, the structural markup is added that allows assistive technology users to navigate through the content more effectively. Another common mistake, as I mentioned, is using the headings to achieve visual results. So making something that isn't actually a heading a heading because you like the look of it. Um, if you want your level three heading to look more like a level two heading, or if you'd like um, you know, some of your body text to have the look of a level two heading, this is something you can accomplish with CSS classes. This slide also illustrates that HTML lists also convey a hierarchical content structure, not just visual formatting. Uh, true lists, rather than just bullet symbols or numbers, should be used. Uh, unordered lists, which usually appear as bullets, should be used when there's no order of sequence or importance. Ordered lists, which usually appear as numbers or letters, uh, suggest a progression or sequence. So a screen reader is going to read uh, a list that's tagged as a list or formatted as a list differently than just some text that uh, is preceded by numbers. So for example, um, what's shown on the screen here is a list with nine items a screen reader encountering this list would say something like list night items, list item one, Gustav Wittig, list item two, student led, and so on. Um, but if it wasn't marked up as a list, we would not really get the announcement that this was a list or the ability to easily jump directly to a specific item in the list. You can also add headings and lists to the HTML code itself. Uh, the example here shows the same content as the previous slide, 
marked up with HTML heading tags. Uh, that's the H2s and the H3s and the HTML ordered list and list item tags. That's the OLs and the LIs. So find out what options for headings and lists are available in the tools you use to create web content and apply them. Other tips for ensuring your content is well structured and clearly written. Uh, use empty or white space to improve readability. Use illustrations, icons, etc. to supplement text. Again, remember to describe those with alternative text. And check your spelling, grammar, and readability. Another key digital accessibility principle is helping the user navigate to relevant content. And this can be accomplished by using the true headings we talked about. You should also provide a link that allows the user to skip over web page navigation to the main content in the page. So the main content is not usually the first thing on a web page. Keyboard and screen reader users generally must navigate a long list of navigation links, uh, sublists of links, icons, site search boxes, and other elements before ever arriving at the main content. Without some sort of system for bypassing the long list of links, um, such as those included in the menus at the top of many of our pages, some users are at a huge disadvantage. So consider those who use computers by uh, tapping their heads on a switch or using a mouth stick to press keyboard keys. Uh, we shouldn't require users to perform any action dozens or hundreds of times before reaching the main content or every time they navigate to a new page. There are a number of different techniques for providing a skip link. Um, some developers place a visible link at the top of the page. Others visually hide the skip link off screen um, and in such a way that uh, it appears, it's positioned on screen when it receives keyboard focus. So as soon as someone hits the tab key to, to tab into the page, that skip link appears. Uh, no matter which technique you use, the idea is to give screen reader and keyboard users the same capability of going directly to the main content that sighted mouse users have. The next principle addresses data tables. Uh, there's two basic uses for tables on the web, data tables and layout tables. Generally speaking, you should try to avoid using tables for layout and use CSS for visual presentation instead. The purpose of data tables is to present tabular information in a grid or matrix and to have columns or rows that show the meaning of the information in the grid. So a sighted user can visually scan a table. They can quickly make visual associations between data in the table and the appropriate row and column headers. But someone who can't see the table can't make these visual associations. So the proper markup needs to be used to associate elements in the table. And when the proper HTML markup is in place, uh, the table tag, table header, table row tag, Screen reader users can navigate through data tables one cell at a time, and they'll hear the column and row headers spoken to them. The next principle addresses the use of color. Uh, when working with color, you need to make sure that color isn't your only method of conveying important information. And this is primarily to ensure your content is accessible to people who have color vision deficiency, sometimes called color blindness, uh, but it's also a principle of universal design for learning uh, by using, excuse me, got a reminder about a meeting. By using more than just color, um, we're providing multiple means of representation. When using color, a good question to ask yourself is, could someone understand this content with the color removed? Uh, the first image on this slide is a map of the London Underground Rail System where the various routes are distinguished only by the color of the lines. The second image on the slide is the same map, but with the color removed. And when the color is removed, there's no way to tell which rail line is which or on which rail line a particular stop is located. One alternative to that is to annotate the graphic to distinguish between routes. 
Uh, this slide depicts part of a map of a transit system, a different transit system, in this case the DC metro system. Color is still being used to indicate the different train lines, but there are also text indicators. So at the end of the green line, there's a green circle with the letters GR. The end of the orange line, there's an orange circle with the letters OR. Um, so this would be a, a better strategy because even if you and I perceive the color green differently, we both know what the line called green looks like to us. Another strategy um, for a transit map, it might be to use different patterns for the lines instead of colors, solid, dash, dotted. Another approach is to use both color and pattern. Uh, this slide depicts colored labels used in the Trello project management application. When Trello's colorblind mode is enabled, a different pattern is added for each color, allowing users with color vision deficiencies to perceive differences among labels. I really like this example because I think it's fairly uh, easy to implement in a lot of the types of content we're producing at the university. So data visualizations like uh, charts, graphs, um, I know just using Microsoft Office that when you create a pie chart, in addition to having different colored pieces of pie, you can apply a pattern to the pie pieces. Same goes with the bar chart. Um, so that's a relatively easy principle to apply in other contexts is, yes, continue to use colors, but also add a pattern or a text designation. In order to be perceivable, um, your foreground color needs to be significantly different from the background color. The example on this slide is an image of text on a gray cloudy background. The text reads, be someone sunshine when their skies are gray. Both the foreground text and the background are shades of gray, except for the word sunshine, which is yellow. And this combination is difficult for many of us to read, but it's especially challenging for users with low vision and users in bright sunlight. There are several tools you can use to check for sufficient contrast. Uh, one of my favorites is the WebAIM Color Contrast Checker, which not only lets you check to see if your color choices meet the contrast ratios specified by WCAG 2.0, um, WCAG 2.0, AA, or WCAG 2.0, specifies one contrast ratio for normal text and another for large text. Uh, large text is defined as 18 point or larger or 14 point and bold or larger. Um, so it lets you check to see if your colors meet those contrast ratio, but also helps you pick color combinations that provide sufficient contrast. So you enter in the hexadecimal codes for the background and foreground colors, and if your color contrast, or if your color combination fails to pass the test, you can adjust the lightness sliders to modify the colors by slight degrees until you get a result that has sufficient contrast. So in this example, the color combination fails, um, for WCAG AA, uh, we see the word fail in red. Um, after we adjusted the colors by darkening the foreground color or lightening the background color, or maybe a little bit of both, um, we could get a passing result um, where instead the word pass appears in green. Another tool that our team likes is Pasiello Group's Color Contrast Analyzer. Uh, which works on the web and with documents and images on uh, your local machine. Uh, this is free desktop software available for Mac and PC. Um, after installing it, you can enter color codes to check or use an eyedropper tool to select colors to check. The eyedropper tool is really handy. There's also a really low tech way to see if color contrast is sufficient, and that's to print the content in question in grayscale. Um, when I recolored this image in grayscale, um, I realized that recolored the be someone sunshine when their skies are gray image in grayscale. Um, I realized that while the gray on gray continued to be problematic, it was really the, the yellow on gray that um, was even harder to read, which had even lower contrast. The next principle addresses forms. 
Um, everyone benefits from a well-organized, usable form, especially those with cognitive disabilities. Uh, forms should be clear, intuitive, and organized in a logical manner. There should be text labels describing the function of each form control. So a form control is a text box, a checkbox, a radio button, a menu, etc. So there should be a text label for each of those form controls. And that text should be associated visually by placing it near the form control and non-visually by using the HTML label element. Don't require that form fields be completed unless it's necessary and clearly identify the fields that are required. Provide inline feedback to users when errors occur and when the form is submitted, uh, feedback about whether the submission was successful. Finally, you'll also need to ensure your forms are keyboard accessible, meaning that they can be completed using only the keyboard. Um, one type of form control that's often problematic with uh, keyboard only navigation is a date picker. Um, we've probably all encountered them before uh, we select a birth date or an event date based on clicking on a calendar. Um, those can be created in a way that's accessible, um, but it's something you need to pay particular attention to. Um, so I encourage you to check out all your forms by attempting to navigate and complete them using just the keyboard. Another basic principle of web accessibility is ensuring links make sense out of context. You want to avoid phrases like click here, read more and more as link text. And this is important because of the way that screen reader users often navigate the web. So screen reader users um, may tab from link to link, skipping the text in between, or may arrive on a website and enter in a keyboard shortcut to bring up a list of all of the links present on the page. So if all of your links are labeled click here, uh, there's no way to determine what you're clicking here to do. Um, and what's the difference between the first link labeled click here and the 17th one labeled click here. So when you add a hyperlink to your content, you know, ask yourself, if you read this link text out of context, would you understand what it's for and what clicking it will do? The next principle addresses media accessibility. In order to ensure your audio and video content is accessible, you must provide captions, transcripts, and when necessary, audio descriptions. Uh, captions are texts that appear on a video to match its soundtrack, including dialogue and nonverbal sounds like thunder or uh, dog barking. The screenshot on the left side of this slide shows a caption video playing in the YouTube player. Captions appear in white text on a black background in the lower third of the video above the player controls. A transcript is a written record of a video or audio recording. It may or may not include descriptions of uh, filler sounds like uh or um. An example of an NPR interview transcript is shown on the right side of the slide. Speakers are identified by their names and titles with their words transcribed exactly as the speaker says them. Audio descriptions may also be beneficial for users with visual disabilities. Uh, a standard audio description narrates the visual parts of the video and is played between the video's dialogue and other essential sounds. Uh, we don't have time to play the example right now, but I'll make sure to send you a link to it. Uh, you may be wondering when it's necessary to provide audio descriptions. Uh, if video is produced with accessibility in mind from the beginning, then audio descriptions are often unnecessary, as long as visual elements within the video are described in the audio. So for example, uh, most of the videos I create are screen, screencast tutorials, where I'm sh showing someone how to do something um, with a website or uh, Microsoft Office content. So I'm describing what I'm doing as uh, the screen shows what I'm doing. In that case, all my actions are described and no additional audio descriptions are needed. We can help with captioning. If you weren't aware, um, our area administers grants to caption 
or transcribe UA owned video and audio that is going to be shared on public or campus wide websites. You can find information about that on our website at accessibility.ua.edu. Uh, we can also provide guidance on how to use captioning and transcribing features in most players, platforms, and lecture capture systems. Um, everything from Camtasia to uh, the Creative Cloud to Facebook. Just quickly finishing some of the um, miscellaneous type tips. Another basic web accessibility principle is to use HTML content whenever possible. Uh, but if you are including other types of content like Microsoft Office files and PDFs on your website, ensuring that that content is accessible as well. A final suggestion before we look at resources for creating accessible content, remove any CAPTCHAs you have associated with your website. Uh, CAPTCHAs present a huge accessibility challenge um, because they present an image that can't be perceived by assistive technology. Um, it's difficult for users with low vision to see and some users with cognitive disabilities to understand. Moving on to resources you can use to create accessible content. And again, I'll send some links to these. Um, if you weren't aware, Microsoft Office offers an accessibility checker. So like the Microsoft Office spelling checker tells you about possible spelling errors, the accessibility checker in Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and Outlook on the web tells you about possible accessibility issues in your Office files. In newer versions of Office, you can access the checker via the review tab as depicted on this slide. In older versions, you can access the checker by going to File, Info, check for issues, check accessibility. And after you run the check, the accessibility checker task pane shown on the right side of this slide uh, shows the inspection results. Uh, why, uh, why to fix any errors, why they're important, and then steps for how to fix them. Adobe Acrobat Pro also offers tools to assist content authors in creating accessible PDFs. There's the Accessibility Checker Full Check and the Make Accessible Action. Uh, the Full Check is going to check a PDF for many of the characteristics of accessible PDFs. Uh, the Make Accessible Action walks you through the steps required to make a PDF accessible. So it's going to prompt you to address accessibility issues like entering in a missing document description or title. Um, looking for scanned text and prompting you to convert that to actual text using optical character recognition and so on. One of our team's favorite sets of tools is the WAVE online web service and browser extensions. Uh, WAVE stands for Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool. And WAVE helps web developers and content creators make their content more accessible by providing visual feedback about a website's accessibility by presenting a web page with embedded icons and indicators. So WAVE can't tell you if your web content is accessible. Um, no automated tool can, only a human can do that. But it can help you evaluate the accessibility of your web content and teach you a bit about accessibility along the way. Uh, WAVE is pretty easy to use. To evaluate a page, you simply enter its address on the WAVE website, which is wave.webaim.org, or you navigate to the page you want to check and select the WAVE icon in the Firefox or Chrome browser extension. Uh, WAVE brings the underlying accessibility information of the page to the forefront so you can evaluate it in context. Each icon, uh, box, and piece of information added by WAVE presents some information about the accessibility of the page. Um, you can select any given icon or indicator and get some information about what the issue is and how to fix it. For example, on this slide, there's a screenshot of um, the WAVE evaluation of the Accessible University homepage. So this is a, 
a homepage for a fictional university um, called Accessible University. The university's logo is an image of text and WAVE is giving us an error that when you select it states uh, missing alternative text. Image alternative text is not present. And if one selected more information in that um, message, we would get some information about why, what alternative text is, why it's important, and then how to fix it in the HTML code. Final resource, all members of the UA community also have access to Accessibility Management Platform, or AMP, a comprehensive accessibility testing and reporting tool. Um, you can access AMP via our website, accessibility.ua.edu, where you'll also find step-by-step -step guides to help you get started. Um, our web developer, Kim Smalley, administers AMP, and she's also happy uh, to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one to help you get started. So in closing, uh, the university is committed to providing all technology users a functional, and accessible technology experience. Everyone in the UA community has some responsibility when it comes to creating accessible content. Um, you don't have to be a web developer or application developer. Um, all of us make choices every day that involve accessibility, um, whether it is adding content to our website, developing a plugin, um, working on a PowerPoint, sending out an email, posting to social media and so on. I would encourage you all to um, apply the information you receive today in making choices that create accessibility. We are here to help you. Um, you can visit us at accessibility.ua.edu. Um, that's all I have and we are now two minutes past three o'clock so I'm going to stop talking <laughs> um, and if anyone has any questions or thoughts to share I would love to hear them. Uh, feel free to do that in the text box or by turning on your mic. I don't see any uh, comments in the chat box or it doesn't appear that anyone's attempting to use their mic. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording and in our meeting. Uh, thank you everyone for your time and attention this afternoon. Um, feel free to get in touch with us if we can help you. Um, I included our contact information in the chat box, um, accessibility.ua.edu. You can email us at accessibility at ua.edu or contact me directly at mfgreen1 at ua.edu. Thanks to everyone. Have a great afternoon.